Hey everybody, Ken Walsky here, checking in with another one of our hashtag Star Trek Picard discussions videos. Today we are going to be talking about the second episode of Star Trek Picard, Maps and Legends. <laughs> So this second episode was pretty damn good, I thought. Uh, it definitely wasn't as good as the very first one, but the premiere episode, of course, really knocked it out of the park and really opened up this, reopened up this world to all of us Star Trek fans and kind of getting us reacquainted with Jean-Luc Picard and what is going on with the you know entire universe at this particular point in time, which is 2399. This second episode, I thought, was a very solid second entry and really felt like it was kind of a... A second chapter in a very long book. It didn't try to outdo the first episode. It didn't try to do more spectacle, more flash, more dash, all those things like that. It definitely felt like it took place just minutes after the first one ended and really continued to unravel this mystery. And we started to meet a couple of more major players. We started to understand a little bit about more what's going on inside of the quadrants, you know, and the kind of the universe that we're sitting in right now with both Picard and Starfleet and the Romulans and all those other different major players. So we started to get a little bit more information. I feel like things are really starting to kind of connect and really start to lay out the groundwork for what's going to turn out to be probably a really spectacular season. Okay, so like my other video, I'm going to talk a little bit about the things that I really enjoyed and then going to go into some of the plot things that kind of moved forward in this particular episode. And then I'm going to talk a couple about my theories about what may be happening in the episodes 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, all the way to episodes 10. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. So the first thing that happened in this episode was a flashback sequence to the synthetic androids rebelling against their human caretakers on Mars and destroying Utopia Planitia. We obviously saw a little bit of this in flashback sequence during the first episode, a little bit of it during the Children of Mars, you know, a short trek, but we actually get to see one of the synthetics, F8, who looks very similar to Soong style androids, such as Data, Lore, and Before, rebel against his human captors and kill several of them, and, you know, we actually get to see, like, them being either hacked or, like, some kind of programming switch turned on or whatever it is, and they start doing different things and alarms go off and all these things like that. This whole sequence was just awesome. I really love the interaction between the workers, the human workers, and the synthetic androids. I really like their kind of dynamic. The androids were definitely creepy. They were definitely disarming and creepy at the same time, which I thought was really great. The creepy smile and the fact that he didn't really understand the jokes and all the stuff like that was definitely unsettling and really tied into their cold-blooded killingness that happened later on in that sequence. I wish we'd actually get to spend more time there and hopefully we'll get a few more flashbacks, kind of what happened on Mars throughout the rest of this season, but it was really, really well done. The next thing that I really, really enjoyed about this particular episode was the kind of process with which Laris and Zaban and Picard kind of went on this little, you know, adventure to uncover what had happened with Dodge. And they wanted to find out how, you know, her death and that firefight at the end of the first episode was covered up. And then when they arrive at her apartment, it looks completely cleaned up and her dead boyfriend is completely gone and all traces of anything that could have happened are completely removed. And they go on this little adventure for about 10 minutes of the episode to try to figure out what happened, who she is, and where her sister may or potentially be at. And it got a little bit kind of like crazy with the technology with connecting the different dots and kind of moving all around. But if you watch it a few more times, it actually kind of all kind of connects really well. And I like the fact that they spent the time to actually piece these different things together. And it wasn't just purely like a 30 second techno babble thing or something that happened between the episodes or that happened off camera. But we actually watched them kind of figuring it out and trying to figure out how to get in touch with Soji and try to protect her from these Romulan operatives that want to harm her that obviously potentially have already killed her sister. So I, I really like that. I appreciated the fact that there was a deliberateness to their actions to kind of showcase to us as the audience that they, these characters are slowly trying to figure it out and we're kind of on that adventure with them to figure out what it is that's going on and how they can get in touch with her sister. Another thing that I really enjoyed was the sequence between Admiral Clancy and Jean-Luc Picard. Now, something that I theorized in my previous video was that Picard was going to go to Starfleet to try to get some assistance and they were going to turn him down because he had crapped all over them on intergalactic, the new, you know, the FFN, the intergalactic news channel and that's exactly what happened and not only did she just 
just tell him no, but she also was kind of aggressive about her no, which also prompted some aggressiveness from Picard. And this is the second time now that we've seen him react in a very aggressive manner, a very hot-headed manner. We saw it in the first episode and now in this one. And it was a little confusing as to why he was doing that. Obviously, he's very passionate about what's going on, but there's a bit more to why that is. We found that out later on in the episode. But this sequence between the two of them I thought was great. She's got a really nice uniform. She's obviously sitting in her position of power as the commander-in-chief of all of the Federation's you know, assets. And Picard comes to her kind of almost like he was on like some kind of hokey adventure almost where he's like yeah just give me a ship and a crew small thing gonna be in and out no problems no big deal and she's like no i'm not just gonna do those things and admirals are typically bad characters especially in tng the admirals are always kind of like up to no good or whatever it is and they're always kind of jerks especially and this definitely connects back to that but she has a bit more motivation than just her being a villain and we find out later on that she's not necessarily a villain but she's definitely pissed off at picard and is not really believing the things that he's saying just on the face of value but i like the fact that they kind of made a connection to the fact that admirals are never really that helpful inside of star trek especially tng they're always kind of villainous in some way or they're always kind of putting some some roadblock in the way of our main characters which is exactly what happens here so i like the fact that they connected that but kind of made it a little bit more adult in the interaction between those two characters i thought it was really well done the other thing that I really enjoyed was the return, I guess you could say, or the revelation that Picard's aromatic syndrome has now begun to affect his body. He sends that whole medical exam into Starfleet Medical, which is one of his friends that I guess they served on the Stargazer together, to get approved, fit for duty to go to Starfleet to ask for that ship. And he actually goes to the vineyard to say, actually, you're not fit, and your syndrome has gotten worse, and it's going to be affecting you and food, it's going to be affecting your, you know, drinking habits, sleeping habits, nightmares, mood swings, anger outbursts, which connects back to the kind of person that we've been introduced to, reintroduced to for Picard, who has serious heavy nightmares, a bit of a kind of a morbid type of personality and the fact that he has serious anger outbursts. And that's not the Picard that we knew, but that's definitely the Picard that is currently with us in this show. And I think it's kind of not only his character arc of who he is now dealing with all of the you know past decisions that he's dealt with and having to deal with all the weight of the different things that he's done in his entire life and his career, but also now this syndrome is plaguing him in a way that's causing him to act a little bit differently, which is really the character that, I, you know, based off of interviews and all different things like that, have really have trying to bring that kind of a character onto the screen. And I think Patrick Stewart plays it perfectly in almost every sequence. You know, he's either that kind of fun-loving captain that we see, and then sometimes it's kind of like a switch where he's this different person. And I think that's really his ability to act in a way that is showcasing not only his age and his frustration, but also the effect that this illness is having on his ability to control his emotions and to think clearly. And I thought it was really, really, really well done by Sir Patrick and the writers. I thought they did a phenomenal job at portraying to the audience that he's still the same guy, but he's also got these other issues. And there's underlying reasons for those other issues. It's not just he's a different character for no reason. The final thing that I really, really enjoyed about this particular episode was, again, it felt like a great second chapter in a much longer story. It didn't try to go over the top. It didn't try to flash us with a bunch of craziness. It was slowly rolling out more of these characters, finding out more about their motivation, finding out key players, trying to understand a little bit more about what's going on in the world. And this is going to definitely get into what happened with my plot discussion, but I just appreciated the fact that it wasn't trying to outdo what had come before and that it was very clearly in my opinion, consciously edited and written and acted in a way that acted very specifically as a second part to the first episode. And, you know, Patrick Stewart has talked very heavily, you know, through all the different pressers leading up into Star Trek Picard coming out, which was that this felt like a 10 hour movie. And the fact that this feels like just like the next minute after the first episode, I think really plays that up quite a bit, that they're really kind of condensing this story into a 10 hour film. And it really connected really, really well, I thought. And if you watch the first episode right into the second one, you definitely get that sense that you're still watching one really long two hour episode as opposed to two episodes or a two parter or something that kind of broke apart and stuff like that. So I thought it was really well done. It's definitely a unique style to take for the character of Picard. We see that a lot on Discovery, but we haven't really seen that with the character of Picard yet. And it was a little jarring at first, but I'm telling you, if you watch the first episode and go right into the second one, it feels really natural and actually fits together perfectly. 
So a few things that I want to talk about plot-wise, things that have kind of happened that have, we've kind of uncovered from this second episode. There's a few very key specific things that kind of occurred. Number one, we find out that the Romulan government has reformed into something called the Romulan Free State. Whatever that is, it's unclear if there's still Imperial Romulans and the Romulan Free State is, Free State is separate or if they're all kind of connected. I know in Star Trek Online, we had the Romulan Republic, which I assume is kind of like the Free State, but the Imperial Romulans were also still running around doing different things with Sela and, you know, all those other characters and stuff like that. So it's unclear if they're going to be present as well, but the Romulan Free State seems to be the government of the Romulans. It's unclear if the Romulans have officially joined the Federation. I don't think that's the case. I think if that was the case, they would have probably announced that somehow, but I, I don't think that's the case at all. I think that they're just a reformed government after the loss of their home worlds, that they've reformed a different type of government in order to kind of continue to govern their people. Another thing that was quite interesting is that the Borg cube is referenced as the Borg artifact. It's the artifact cube. And it looks as though scientists from all over the quadrant, both Federation and non-Federation scientists are on this Borg cube being maintained by Romulans to study and you know reclaim, as they say, these different Borg drones and these different Borg pieces of technology. I think different people are there to look at technology and other people are there to help out with the Borg drones. It looks like Soji, who is Dodge's sister's primary purpose there is to assist in the reclamation process. Some other people were removing all the Borg attachments from the, you know, Pete the drone sitting on the table. And I think her job is to then help rebuild that person back into a functioning individual. Similar to that what happened with Hugh and Seven of Nine and other, you know, reclaimed Borg people. They had to kind of readjust to who they were at that particular point and kind of deal with all the atrocities that they had done and also who they were previously and now where they are going in the future. So I think Soji's job is to help kind of facilitate that recovery process for those individuals. So that was interesting because in a lot of the press release information, the cube was referred to as the Borg prison cube. It wasn't the reclamation or the artifact cube, but they're calling it that. So are they changing it or are we going to find out later on that these Borg reclaimed Borg drones are actually being kept there against their will? And maybe that's kind of the plot with Seven of Nine and Hugh that their job is to try to, you know, bust these drones out of there. And maybe that's going to be the overarching plot that the Picard and the company kind of go on, which is to bust all of these, you know, drones, these reclaimed drone people out of the cube so they can go and live their lives. I'm not quite sure, but that's just kind of a speculation on my part. Another thing that was quite interesting is that the Admiral, when she's talking to Picard, says that a lot of the member worlds of the Federation threatened to leave the Federation because they were helping out the Romulans. There's a lot of bad blood there. They were the enemy for so long. Now, she says that there were 14 member worlds threatening to leave. And then the next sentence she says, was I going to do, you know, watch the Federation implode? Now, there's a lot of planets in the Federation. To imply that 14 leaving would implode the Federation, I think, is a bit of an overstatement unless those were some of the founding key members of the Federation, which could potentially cause a cascading effect of other planets thereafter leaving. And I think that that may potentially connect to the plot of Star Trek Discovery Season 3, where we see the Federation is completely fallen apart and there's only a few member worlds left on the Federation flag. That may be kind of like a, the seeds of that kind of implosion for Discovery Season 3 being planted in this sequence. But I, I didn't think that they put that line in there for no reason. So I definitely think that that might be a plot plot thread that connects the two shows, even though there's a long period of time in between them, but it's definitely potentially in my mind laying some groundwork for that particular plot element to be revealed inside of Star Trek Discovery Season 3, which is airing right after Picard wraps up. Another thing that we find out in this episode is that there is another kind of secret clandestine organization that Romulans operate, which is called the Zat Vash. And apparently they're separate from the Tal Shiar, more dangerous, way more secretive, have a bunch of other things going on. And apparently they hate cybernetics. And I think that they are in cahoots with Commodore O, who we meet inside of this particular episode, who pretends like she doesn't know anything about what's going on when she talks to the CNC, the Admiral Clancy lady who calls her up saying, hey, do you know what's going on that what Jean-Luc is talking about? She's like, no, I don't know anything about that. And then she immediately calls in another character named Lieutenant 
Rizzo, who I believe is the sister of Narek. They refer to each other as brother and sister. I don't know if they mean like literal familial lines or perhaps they're just saying, you know, like they're just so close that they have that relationship. But I think that they mean, you know, actual familiar, like they're actually related. So the sister of Narek, who's Lieutenant Rizzo, who looks like a human, but is clearly not a human. She is a Romulan. And I think Narek and her both work for the Zat Vash and they're attempting to do something. Now, Narek is obviously there to try and gain the trust of Soji so that she will begin to tell him information that they need or perhaps divulge where she's actually from or if she activates in similar fashion to the way Dodge did, she won't try to kill him like Dodge did to the other Romulans. She'll actually be ahead, you know, and go ahead and start telling him information that he may want because apparently they're looking for other versions of these types of perfect androids, these perfect and synthetics that Bruce Maddox and others may have already built. So they're doing something there. He's definitely trying to get some information and they're working for this Zat Vash group, which we've never heard about before. I don't know how I feel about the idea of another clandestine organization being embedded into the Star Trek mythos, but I'm curious to see how that kind of unfolds throughout the rest of the season. Something else that we learned in this episode is that Worf, Riker, and LaForge are all still alive. This is stated by Zaban inside of the sequence where he's like, hey, you need a crew to go with you. What about these guys? And Picard says no, because if I ask them, they'll definitely do it, but I don't want to put them at risk of being hurt or potentially even their careers being damaged by assisting him. Now, what's interesting is he doesn't list off several other characters that Picard could lean on, namely that of Beverly Crusher. And he did lean on Beverly in, you know, the season finale of TNG, the end of TNG, you know, these are the voyages. He used her to kind of get to the signal at the center of the universe that he had to go and, you know, get information on. That doesn't mean, in my opinion, that she's dead. It's just that he didn't list her off for a specific reason. And that could just mean that the fact that this mission is a bit more action adventure oriented and not scientific in nature, that he wouldn't have listed Beverly Crusher as an option to him at that time. I don't think it's implying that she's essentially dead, but she clearly wouldn't be used on this particular adventure, at least not at this particular point. I, I don't believe that Gates McFadden would just simply refuse to go on to Picard either in this season or the second season simply because she was at the Dagon premiere with Patrick Stewart and everybody else. So clearly she's still involved with these people and still knows what's going on and is still involved with Star Trek. She goes to the conventions and stuff. So the likelihood of her appearing at some point, I think is still very, very high. The final thing that we find out in this episode is that Dodge's being, like her like personality, her existence, wasn't really traceable past the three-year mark. It looks like three years prior to the events of the show, Dodge kind of came into existence and like all of her records and her education and her history were all forged and falsified and stuck onto the Federation, you know, I guess computer network. And then she just kind of appeared and started going about her life like normal. So it looks as though that Bruce Maddox, I'm assuming it's Bruce Maddox, finished up building Soji and Dodge about three years ago and then sent them off into the quadrant to go do different things. It's unclear if they were sent off with a purpose or if he just let them go and kind of just be who they wanted to be and one of them wound up working on the Borg Reclamation Project and the other one wound up trying to go to the Daystrom Institute to basically start up, I guess, the whole new project of cybernetic mind stuff. So I don't quite know if he meant that to do that intentionally or if it was just by an accident. It's very interesting either way, but we did find out that they haven't been around for that long. Okay, so that wraps up our video discussion for today. I hope that you guys and gals enjoyed this video, and I'm very curious to hear what you thought of the second episode of Picard. What are some of your likes, dislikes, complaints, concerns, worries, questions? Get all that information up down below. Get your theories up down below. I'm dying to hear what you guys and gals think of it. Get that stuff down below, and we'll go ahead and get our conversation started. Live long and prosper, my trickies!